Um, so we have a variety of different perspectives, uh, different companies, three CEOs, and an executive of a large uh, pharmaceutical company. Why don't you give us your elevator pitch? Just kind of go right down the line, starting on that end and, and ending over here. Yeah, sure. So my elevator pitch used to be we can take a single drop of blood, do 128 diagnostic tests in less than 10 minutes in the doctor's office. But that just leads to a long conversation about uh, a particular company. So, um, Which we'll it, have. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I knew it would. Um, so really what it is, it's about data. And so the, the place where medical decisions are being made is in the doctor's office. That drives all the expense. It drives all the outcomes, whether positive or negative, all the therapeutic decisions. Most of those are done based on conversations with the patients. So our whole job is to do collect all of the data out of that patient sample we possibly can and deliver it back to the doctor in 15 minutes while that patient's still sitting right there in front of them. Excellent. Gabe? Right. Uh, yeah, uh, I run Freenome. We develop non-invasive cancer screening methods uh, powered by machine learning and traditional biotech um, uh, lab technologies. Um, so really, I guess the media calls it liquid biopsies. I really hate that terminology because <laughs> it's wrong for so many reasons. Um, but we like to think of ourselves as just detecting cancer at the earliest points possible using non-invasive methods. I like this. Give us the rant on why liquid biopsy is the bad way of describing it. Sure. Um, I think f for what we do, <laughs> it's inaccurate, right? For what uh, some of the other companies do, like uh, Gardent, I think liquid biopsy is fine. Um, but for s sort of cancer screening, right, you're really trying to detect the tumor at the early stage, uh, uh, earliest points possible, whereas biopsies sort of give patients the suggestion that you're learning something about the molecular nature of that tumor and whether, you know, you have sort of that confirmatory nature of the tumor, whereas, whereas our test is not really that sort of final word, right? The invasive biopsy is still going to be sort of the final standard um, for, for a while uh, in terms of whether somebody has cancer or not. Liquid, calling it liquid biopsy sort of gives the patients this false conception that they can replace invasive biopsies with this new technology, which is not going to happen for a very long time. Um, so I, I really think that, you know, under the liquid biopsy branch, there's screening, there's uh, sort of more traditional diagnostics, and then there's like patient monitoring and various different uh, uh, things that answer different questions. And to put that all under the umbrella of liquid biopsies is uh, irresponsible, I think both to the patients and to um, the, the clinicians that you're trying to sell the test to. Yeah. Like starting with a note of humility. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, Lynn, you're up. Sure. I'm the CEO of MyAvant Sciences. We're a biopharmaceutical company focused on women's health and endocrine diseases. We're in late stage phase three clinical development, evaluating an oral once a day treatment for women with heavy menstrual bleeding from uterine fibroids women suffering from endometriosis-associated pain, and also for men with advanced prostate cancer. And then we also have a second drug for women with infertility who uh, we're developing as part of assisted reproduction. Our mission is to become a global leader in women's health, bringing innovative treatments for those areas that women suffer from that have been ignored by big pharma. We are currently um, really focused on transforming the treatment of endometriosis and uterine fibroids, diseases which are treated with surgery and invasive procedures. We'd like to have them be treated with medicine, a pill. And that will give the hundreds of thousands of women who undergo hysterectomy each year a medical alter alternative. Huh. Are there any other biotech firms that are specifically focused on developing drugs for women? There are, but they are very few and far between. So I can sort of name them on one hand. This is a wide open space. And so when I was looking around for what I wanted to do as a CEO, immuno-oncology is very exciting, but it is so crowded. Here, half the population are women. They are suffering often in silence because these diseases are embarrassing and nobody wants to talk about them. And there is wide open space, so a real opportunity to make a difference. Sean, tell us what you do at Amgen. So I'm head of research and development, and we uh, focus in a pretty wide area of uh, therapeutic areas these days. Um, our major um, focus in, in drug discovery and development these days is having a kind of biology first, modality second approach, where we seek to have as much human validation of our drug targets as possible 
by looking at the experiments of nature that exist in population genetics and having insight into biochemical pathways by studying uh, the kind of variants that occur in the population that are attributable um, to disease risk. And that's something that we've, um, you know, pioneered a, 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 in, in the industry in terms of having it be an industrial approach for the way that we're approaching uh, discovery and, um, and uh, drug development. Uh, we have uh, traditional areas we work in, um, uh, nephrology, inflammation, uh, supportive care oncology, bone health. Uh, we're branching out now in, into launching uh, products in the cardiovascular and neuroscience spaces lately. All right, Carrie, let's get right into it. Let's talk about Theranos. All um, right. Do you, I assume you get this question a lot because you also have a one-drop blood testing. Uh, Usually no more than once an hour. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. So wh what, what can be learned from the, the Theranos experience? So let me, um, so I could go on for hours, but let me take the uh, unusual stance of defending Theranos, okay? Because it's, it's really a good idea. Right? It needs to happen, and so the, the vision of being able to take diagnostics out of the existing environment and the way it's done today is a great one. So today is, I like to make the argument all the time that today's diagnostic system is broken. We are killing patients because we put blood samples in Ford Fiestas, we drive them across town, we FedEx them or, or fly them to North Carolina or, or other places, and it takes several days for that uh, sample to get back, and then it's lost. So there's a huge number of malpractice cases that are because that the test is performed correctly, but it's never communicated back to the patient. A lot of patients don't go to the lab when they're asked to. No matter how hard you try in your healthcare system, you can move it up to about 80% of patients are actually compliant with the diagnostic testing order. And every day I talk to physicians and say, hey, I've got this patient on this drug. I might be wrecking their kidneys, but I think they really need the drug. I just can't get them to go to the lab, right? What, what do I do about that? So the idea of decentralizing diagnostics and getting the data in the doctor's hands a lot faster, I think is a great idea. And the, I like to thank you know, the vision of Theranos and, and where they went because every major healthcare system has sat down and thought about Theranos, right? They put a tiger team on it and said, hey, what could we do with this? And most of them concluded that, hey, we might be saving a nickel by sending it to Quest or LabCorp, but we're costing ourselves hundreds of dollars per patient over here in terms of physician efficiency and medical mistakes and follow-up phone calls and, and patients that just don't go to the lab. So in the end, what Theranos was trying to do is really a good thing. Gabe, do you we're take just, we're just gonna do it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, do you take any lessons from it as someone who's taken <clears throat> money from you know, traditional uh, or, or a, a big VC firm and has maybe some of the expectations and weight that come with uh, backing from companies like that? Sure. Um, I think that, by and large, the effect of Theranos has been good on the space. Um, I don't think... So we haven't done a sort of single financing round without having to show data uh, on, on um, uh, our, our assay and uh, the current state of development. Um, and I think that's largely a reaction to companies like Theranos uh, they were able to raise millions, hundreds of millions of dollars without showing people uh, real data, right? And, and I think, I, I would like to think that um, because of the Theranos event that more and more investors are going to now do sort of better diligence on this sort of scientific data. That being said, I still hear about companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, billion dollars without showing data. Um, so I, I, I do think net positive effect has been this better diligence I hope that it continues um, because people's memory tends to be really short <laughs> and, and I think you know, we have a tendency of trying to move things very fast uh, in, in sort of venture-backed companies. Um, so I, I hope that we don't sort of default back into this, what, what doing what's easy uh, mm -hmm. of not doing the proper diligence. Mm -hmm. Lynn, did you want to say something? I guess if I had a comment, I'm just uh, sad that she was a woman. I think there are too many, there are not enough women CEOs. And I will tell you, um, two out of three times when I'm on a plane and somebody asks me what I do, uh, the f next comment is Theranos. Um, <laughs> right. So yeah. I just, I'm, I'm kind of sad for that, but. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Sean, from your perspective within this sort of large organization. Well, you know, I mean, we of course, um, interact with an enormous 
spectrum of companies in, in both the in small company kind of land with, with diagnostics, therapeutics, et cetera. And what you see is a kind of bell-shaped curve of biologic variation in the hype, right? So, you know, <laughs> that you just have to recognize that that curve exists and that, you know, uh, it's really just the, the bottom tail of that bell curve that is represented by this kind of situation where people are over-hyping a technology in, in the way that occurred at, at Theranos. Mm -hmm. But you have to have your guard up, and the, the point about the diligence mm -hmm. is important, and people do get carried away um, with the idea of doing something that is actually a great idea, but maybe lots of smart people have been working on the problem for a long time, and the idea that some small group of people suddenly have figured out how to do it overnight in a garage might not be true. So we have some people up here who work on diagnostics and people who work on therapies. Um, do, you, do you see a lot of overlap um, between those communities or do you just sort of, do you find that people sort of focus on one um, or, or the other through their careers and through your company? I think more and more it's becoming clear that uh, therapeutics and diagnostics sort of go hand in hand. Um, what happened to BMS uh, last year is a great example of this where you know, they, they had a, a, a trial that failed, mostly because I think, you know, they uh, did a poor job of uh, handling sort of the inclusion exclusion criteria in their trials, which probably should have been done with some kind of companion diagnostic. Um, I think the need for uh, sort of more diagnostics that are paired with therapeutics so that right people get the right care uh, is becoming very evident. Um, and, and, and something that traditionally we haven't done as well as an industry. Um, so I, I do believe that we are heading into a future where more pairs of diagnostics that are pure, thera therapeutics are going to happen. I, I would agree with I think traditionally they have been quite separate. More and more there is yeah. a push to move them together as we're talking about personalized medicine. And I'll give the example of I'm developing a therapeutic or my event's developing a therapeutic for endometriosis. This disease is diagnosed today by an invasive laparoscopy. And so these young women who are suffering can wait for diagnosis for seven to 10 years. And if there could be a blood test that could do this for them, they could be diagnosed right away instead of having years where they're wondering what's wrong with them. Doctors can't diagnose them. Maybe it's in their head. So I think uh, diagnostics are incredibly important, but obviously then they need to be followed with the right therapeutic. Yeah, and diagnostics is cheap. It's really, really cheap. And, and so f the thing that's always, um, I guess, puzzled me is that there's a pressure on, all, on cost, obviously, across the entire healthcare system to reduce cost. But if you, if you quit investing in the insightful data required to drive therapy, you're going to end up with a much more expensive healthcare system in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a, that's what's starting to be realized is that you can invest in data collection and insight into what's going on that patient through a diagnostic and make much better decisions about a drug, much better targeted therapy, uh, less side effects, et cetera. So that, that mentality is starting to, to creep in, but it hasn't been there historically. What do you attribute that underinvestment to? There's no multi-billion dollar exits in diagnostics. There are in therapeutics. So when you talk to a healthcare investor, you know, and I've done this for years, you walk in and say, hey, we got this great, you know, technology. Um, it's a diagnostic. Sorry, my partners just won't let me touch that. How about over here? Do you think there's underinvestment in diagnostics? Well, I, I think, you know, there's a couple areas where the convergence that we're hearing about between um, the therapeutics and diagnostics is, is clearly happening, and it's mainly oncology and infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. There's much less of that kind of opportunity today in the state of the art in any other therapeutic area. So you tend to have... Um, a separation. The business models are very different. The margins are very different. You know, so companies that are focused in in human therapeutics find the diagnostics work to be something that they don't really want to get into as a business. I mean, the only real exception is Roche Genentech, and I'd argue that you know it's they've yet it's yet to be clear that they've had the synergy that they're expecting between those two. Uh, areas. So I think that um, it'll come over time. Um, it'll be spearheaded, you know, uh, by uh, these areas where th it's becoming routine to have some kind of patient stratification um, marker. But, um, you know, I, I still think when you look out there in the space, 
there are, you know, there, there are diagnostics companies and there are therapeutic companies, and that's, that's not going to change for a while. I, think. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of your um, stories as, as CEOs. Let's talk about, um, Gabe, you, you have software background and, you know, the technology that your company is based around did not spin out of UCSF. Um, can you talk about founding, you know, what's kind of a different kind of biotechnology company? Obviously, there are others, but sure. it's maybe not the most traditional uh, pathway. Yeah, uh, our, our path to forming a company was very uh, non-traditional. As you say, we, we were not spun out of a university. Our IP was all generated in-house. Um, in retrospect, that was probably a big mistake, I, I, I would say, because... Um, the first, I think, six months of the company's life was really the founders going door to door to various PIs at universities just asking for samples so that we could do research. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really difficult place to sort of start from because no one trusts you when you have zero track record, uh, right? And, and you're wanting to do the research right, but if you, you know, don't have the samples, that's almost impossible to do. Um, and large, the reason why so many companies spin out of IP that was generated at universities is the universities do have those samples that they can do research on, and a lot of the initial research is done by the time um, the, the company gets spun out. Um, so I think in that way, I think it was really in interesting. I think there were benefits to that, though, uh, which was that once we were able to get samples, um, which a you know, couple of professors really, I think, took a shot on us um, to, to sort of work with us to develop the initial IP, uh, there was no latitude given to us for any sort of subsequent meetings, right? We had to go data first, otherwise they wouldn't listen to us. As you say, I don't have sort of an advanced degree, MD or PhD, um, so there was no benefit of doubt uh, given to me in that regard. Um, and then um, there was also uh, the fact that we were not spun out of the university, so we didn't automatically have KOLs that uh, would sort of speak on our behalf uh, immediately. So I think uh, the combination of those reasons really uh, formed a different type of company where we are always telling people sort of in-house, where's the evidence, right? Where's the data uh, for any of the claims that they're making? Partly because that was how we were born as a company. Uh, and that's the way we've approached investors. That's the way we've approached KOLs. That's the way uh, we currently approach any partners that, uh, that we're working with. Um, and... Lynn, I want to talk to you a little bit just when we were, when we were in the back. We we're talking about um, the diversity and inclusion conversation that has been happening in the, in, you know, the straight tech industry. Uh, and and, and the, uh, the similar conversation is occurring uh, in biotech. And you had some, some interesting numbers. And the context for this uh, is that, you know, in tech a lot of the times, and I think you hear a little bit less of this now, but for a long time you heard it's just a pipeline that like if there were more women inside tech companies, there'd be more women running tech companies um, and founding tech companies. And what's your experience been uh, in the biotech world? So I think people know the problem in high tech, but not so much in biotech. And the fact of the matter is in biotech, the life sciences, 50% of the workforce are women. But you don't see that in the leadership. And in fact, if you look at pharma, 16% of uh, the executive committees are women. And so you say, well, that's just big pharma, that's old school. Well, it's not true. If you look in 2014 of the companies going public, the number was 19% were women in the leadership roles. And so even though 50% of the workforce are women, you're not seeing this translate into the senior positions. And so that's why we need more women on boards and there's been a big push for that. We need more women in leadership roles, and we have to be very proactive about it. And I'll just tell my yeah, personal story, do. which was eye-opening for me. And I've been a woman in this business for a very long time. And I left motivation after being chief medical officer for a decade, had a wonderful career, was started as a third employee, built that company to you know a very successful um, company. And I didn't get a single CEO offer. I got lots and lots of chief medical officers after I stepped out, but I didn't get a single CEO offer until I self-declared. And finally, I told somebody, look, I've got another operating role in me, but I want to be CEO if I'm going to do it. Once I self-declared, I had no problem. Isn't that interesting? A lot of opportunity. So I think it just there's still um, a need for women to self-advocate and for people to ask. We're not as likely to sort of volunteer ourselves. 
Let's stay on your sort of CEO and corporate structure right now. Um, so Myvent is part of Royvent Sciences. Maybe you can just sort of describe the kind of operating structure there, how it, sure. how it all works. Well, I think we've, everybody here is trying to do drug, drug development more quickly, more efficiently. And so as I was looking around at opportunities, I came across this company, Royvent Sciences, which is a very unusual company which is, prides itself on value creation. And what they do is they look for undervalued assets in big pharma, maybe in academia, where they don't have the opportunity to take it to the next level. And they bring them in, they in-license them, and they organize them into companies that are sort of therapeutically focused. And so I met uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, 31-year-old, who heads up Royvent Sciences, right as he was looking at uh, doing diligence on two drugs from Takeda, which are ultimately the two drugs that were brought in to my event. And we formed this company. I was employee number one just a little over a year ago, and now we've got five phase three global clinical trials running. How could we do that? Because they have this model where the team that does diligence becomes the development team, and then they provide support as we get our company up and going. And so they supported us while we took the company public and raised money, gave us the staff so that we could quick start, if you will. And now we've hired our own team and we're up and running much more independently and they're our major investor, shareholder. So it's a wonderful, innovative model to speed up drug development. Let's go, um, because we want to talk about some of these moonshots. Um, it's kind of a lightning round, so we'll go kind of quickly. But like, what would you say, you know, let's go 10 years out um, what's something you would like to see that's on the market, or you expect to see that's on the market that would be surprising to people uh, in innovation? Maybe let's, we'll start on, on this end and go this way. Uh, well, I think there's, there's great promise in that time frame in um, having um, the uh, artificial intelligence kind of uh, machine-based learning applied to the system's biology of cells, tissues, disease, um, so that we can um, become a little bit more of an engineering-based discipline rather than one that is uh, operating with fragments of information without a, a, without a wiring diagram, if you will, of the mm -hmm. system that we're trying to, uh, to uh, troubleshoot and correct. Perfect. So get your questions ready, because when we get to the end, uh, we're yeah. coming to you. Yeah. I guess I'm hoping to a place where really technology, and this is why I love the Bay Area, some of the digital technology and the information technology gets much more embedded into biotech. And so the way we run our clinical trials completely changes and that we're seeing patients where they are, they're able to bring us data much more quickly. And then ultimately patient care is done much more out of the home and, and made much easier for the patient than it is now. I think traditionally, you know, I, I think we touched on this briefly, but traditionally diagnostics has been that ugly duckling. Um, uh, of, of biotech uh, that no one really wanted to touch or fund because the ROIs are really low. I think we're seeing a shift in that in this age, especially in sort of in spaces like cancer screening where the space is really big. But I do think that there is sort of a missing piece if we're talking 10 years down the road where we just need better sensors uh, and, and uh, better sort of ways of getting data, right? Instead of a blood draw, like we should be able to get continued uh, sort of sensor data that we can learn from to diagnose these diseases earlier and earlier. And I don't think that's really going to happen with sort of the current level of technology and sensors. And I hope that this renewed interest in diagnostics really spurs on a new generation of innovation, not only on the software side, but also on the hardware side that will enable new ways of capturing data continuously. Cool. Great. In 10 years, I think everyone is going to be tested for every single diagnostic test every time they touch the healthcare system and computers and analytics are going to be able to handle that large stream of data in an intelligent way and help doctors make better decisions, lead to better patient outcomes. All right. So we've got a question right here. Yes. Hi, I'm Phil Polikoff of Stanford University. What's your reflections on the World Health Organization's definition of health in 1948? Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely just the absence of disease or infirmity. I'd say my, my gut reaction to that statement is um, if you look at the incidence of inflammation and autoimmune disease in the Western worlds, it's skyrocketing. And, uh, and why is that? These are stress-mediated diseases. They're uh, mediated by things in our environment. Um, what's causing that? No one knows today. 
but there's something about the modern world, the more Western the world is, the more allergy, the more autoimmune disease happens. And um, so there's, a, there's an element to progress which challenges that definition uh, of health. Anybody else? I mean, I think that definition of health uh, speaks to something that needs to happen in healthcare that currently hasn't happened in sort of the Western medicine, especially in, in uh, the United States, where we should be moving really towards preventative medicine uh, as opposed to sort of this acute intervention uh, that the, the entire system is sort of built around uh, right now. And I think if we make a push, and this is going to you know, take everything, it's going to take te technology development, it's going to take patient behavior change. Uh, in order to uh, make this happen, but we should really be focused on how do we keep people healthier longer uh, rather than what do we do about it when they get sick. Yeah. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Irene Oyenahu. I am from Big Health. Um, so my question is, what is preventing the multi-billion dollar exit in diagnostics? If something can prevent or cure cancer early, that sounds pretty valuable to me. I think cancer screening is the biggest exception to the, uh, to the rule of diagnostics, right? Um, if you're talking about just the number of people that should be getting colonoscopies that don't uh, this year in the United States, it's 35 million people, uh, right? Those kinds of sort of numbers of people that should be taking a particular diagnostic is very rare. Um, and, and I think that um, as we sort of, again, uh, go head, head towards more into sort of preventative medicine uh, in spaces as big as cancer, where the incidence not, population incidence numbers are really high, um, I think we will see opportunities in diagnostics that have these high return on investments, but traditionally that hasn't been the case. Last one, right here. Sure. Uh, we've heard a lot about venture capital and investing, but I uh, wanted to know if somebody could speak to uh, the role of big philanthropies uh, are playing in biomedical research and the role they can play, say, in fixing certain market problems. <laughs> Well, I guess maybe I would, I'd like to see them play a bigger role because I think there are ways that philanthropies and uh, develop, drug development companies, therapeutic companies can potentially work together to um, maybe get medicines to the right places um, where they're not going because maybe the markets aren't there, but the philanthropy might be there to help these companies focus on areas which are traditionally underserved. Um, there are ways where maybe the, the financial incentives aren't quite aligned, but with philanthropy and the know-how of the companies, you could do some really important things. So I think there's a major role for it. Yeah. All right, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you so yeah. much.